Hello, Ruby Kaigi. Um, I started learning Ruby and Rails in 2012. As one does, I created my first Rails application with Rails New and ran bundle install to make sure everything was in place. But what good is an empty Rails application? So I created a user model with two string attributes, name and role. After the generator was done, I opened the user RB file with excitement and found an empty class definition. That was not what I had expected. I thought something had gone wrong and the name and role fields I had specified had not been generated since they were not in the user class definition. It took me a while after that to understand that Rails, or rather Active Record, did things in a slightly different way to other ORMs. Where most ORMs would have static attributes, methods that would map to your database columns, Active Record actually discovers your database columns at runtime and generates the required attributes dynamically. This was a beautiful, fundamentally different and effective way to approach what an ORM looked like by building on the dynamic nature of the Ruby language. However, it was still missing a large piece for me as a developer. I would never know what attributes my models had by looking at the model file itself. This made understanding code written by others or my earlier self really hard. And it also made reasoning about the code hard as well. Since the inner workings of what Active Record was doing was opaque to me, it made me think there, that there was some magic happening in the background. Nine years later, I now know that there is no magic. And anything that is close to magical about the whole thing is the power of the Ruby language and how it is capable of representing various metaprogramming or domain-specific languages like this very effectively. So today we will be talking about DSLs with the aim of demystifying them. So hello again, my name is Ufuk Lolo, and I'm an engineering manager on the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team at Shopify. You can reach me on various social media platforms using the handle Paracycle. So what is a DSL? Well, DSL stands for Domain Specific Language which is a programming language specialized to a particular application domain. This is in contrast to the general purpose programming languages that we use every day, like Ruby or JavaScript. Actually, in the previous talk, Martin gave a good example of a DSL, which is regular expressions. But the DSLs we write in Ruby um, use Ruby metaprogramming. Ruby itself is a general purpose programming language, but it has support for very rich metaprogramming techniques. That is, you can write code in Ruby that generates other Ruby code at runtime. Any method in Ruby can perform an include or an extend on a class or define methods dynamically. Using these techniques, we can write domain specific language primitives in Ruby very easily. Actually, many of the common Ruby gems that you use daily make use of DSLs in one form or another. For example, the gem file syntax that Bundler uses is a Ruby file with seemingly new instructions like gem or group, etc. However, these are just methods implemented by Bundler in Ruby to perform higher level operations. Rake is another example of a DSL that most of you are probably using. Instructions like namespace and task in rake files are again just normal Ruby methods implemented by rake as a domain specific language. Yet another example is RSpec. All the describe and context and it instructions in RSpec are again plain Ruby methods that set up and execute your test cases properly. Finally, if you're using Rails, you're constantly using DSL patterns as well from defining routes to configuration, from defining associations to defining helper methods in controllers, Rails provides a very rich domain specific language for building rich web applications. So why are DSLs so popular? There are actually many benefits to providing a DSL as an interface to the consumers of your code. 
The primary one is that you prevent your users from writing boilerplate code. Can you imagine if you had to write all the code to define an association in Active Record for every association over and over again? Secondly, it makes for a more natural API that your users will learn and remember more easily. Developers will be thinking more about what they want to do than how they want to do it. For example, developers just want to declare that there is a belongs to association rather than teaching their models how that association should be found. Okay, now that we know what DSLs look like, let's see how we can build something like that. Imagine that we're writing an application that deals with sensitive data, which needs to be encrypted as soon as the data is populated. We want some kind of an encrypted version of Atter Accessor, but we want to encapsulate the logic to implement it in a single place. In this case, that will be the encryptable module. The way we want to use it is, for example, we want to declare a credit card class, include the encryptable module, which will give us access to the Atter encrypted method. And then we can call that method with a symbol, um, which stands for the name of the attribute we want. Let's see how we can implement this. So let's build the encryptable module, which will provide this DSL. The first thing uh, we're going to do is to add an included method. Since encryptable module will be included into our classes, we won't be able to add any class methods through the module itself. This is because in Ruby, when a module is included into a class or a module, only the instance methods survive the trip. In order to add the Atter encryptable method on the credit card class itself, we need to use the module included hook to do a dynamic extend on the target class with a class methods module. The class methods module only defines one method named Atter encrypted since that is all we need. The Atter encrypted method is the main target of our concern. It takes an attribute name and performs its magic. Ruby magic. When called, it first defines an accessor on the class using the name of the past in attribute. So for the credit card example, the attribute name would be number, and we would have a number getter setter defined on the credit card class. Next, we construct the name of the encrypted attribute and define two methods dynamically. The first method is a getter for the encrypted attribute. So in our credit card case, this will be the number encrypted method. All the getter does is to call the base attribute to get the clear text value, encrypt it, and return it. The second dynamic method is a setter for the encrypted attribute. So again, in our credit card case, this will be the number encrypted equals method. This method basically does the opposite of the first one. It decrypts the value that is passed in and assigns it to the clear text attribute value. Now we just need to define how encrypt and decrypt should work. For this simple example, I made them convert the string to and from its hex encoding. So there's no real encryption happening here in this example. So please don't use these routines in your code for real encryption, you have been warned. That's it, that's our DSL implemented. Let's see it in action now. We create a new instance of our credit card class and assign a credit card number to the number attribute. At this point, if we print the card number, we can see that it is correct. But we can also ask the object for the encrypted number and we can see that we get the encrypted number back, the encrypted number. Moreover, we can assign an encrypted value to the encrypted number attribute. And when we print the card number, we can see that it changed. So great, this is all working out and our credit card class definition ended up being super compact. We were able to encapsulate all the logic in the encryptable module and got rid of a lot of boilerplate that we would need. So despite these many benefits, there are also some drawbacks to using DSLs as well. Everything is not sunshine and roses. I would argue that DSLs have two major problems. The first is that it makes it really, really hard to statically analyze a program. Since DSLs use metaprogramming to generate code from code, a lot of things can only 
be available if the program is actually executed. But if the program is statically analyzed, it means it's not run, so those things won't exist. Secondly, it makes it hard for people who are new to the particular DSL to know what is happening behind the scenes. That is why uh, many people who are new to Ruby and Rails consider many things magic. DSLs reduce the cognitive load when declaring our classes, but they make it hard to understand what's happening when we're using the resulting code. In order to explain these points, I will refer to a gem named Smart Properties, which provides a rich property definition API as a DSL. An example usage would look like this message class, which includes the Smart Properties module. Now, maybe you are familiar with the Smart Properties gem. If you are, please try to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's not. Can you tell exactly what this message class definition is doing? You can probably tell that it will create some getters and setters for subject, body, and time since they're declared as properties. But will it also create predicate methods like body question mark as well? Moreover, what exactly is the difference between a property bang call and a property call? Just like how these are difficult questions for a developer who doesn't know the smart properties gem, these are also difficult questions for a static type checker too. Is this code well typed? Are there any errors in the usages here? As a matter of fact, the code has an error and will raise a no method error exception at runtime. How could we have caught this error without having to run the file? Well, if we knew the smart properties gem well enough, we would know that it does not generate a body question mark predicate method in the first place. So we could have caught this error at code review, but it is likely that an extra question mark will um, be missed by people who are doing the code review as well. We need a way to automatically check this. This is exactly what a type checker is good for, but it also doesn't know what property does behind the scenes. So can we teach it? It turns out we can. Most gradual type checkers allow you to create files to describe the parts of the code that are not statically visible. For Sorbet, this happens via what is called RBI files, which stand for Ruby interface files. And for steep or type prof, this happens through Ruby syntax or RBS files. I will be presenting examples for RBI in this talk, but the RBS equivalents would be pretty much the same thing in a different syntax. So if we start to write a message.rbi file, this file tells our static type checker, which is Sorbet in this case, that the message class declares getters and setters for subject, body, and time attributes. Note that an RBI file is just a Ruby file with missing method bodies. We don't need method bodies since those are not relevant to the external interface of the message class. If you're familiar with C, this is like the header file as opposed to the C file where in the header file, function definitions are placed, but in the C file, you also have their bodies. With this RBI file in place, our type checker can now tell us what is wrong with our original code. It tells us that the method body question mark doesn't exist on the message class. This looks very promising. But now that opens up another question. Are we going to have to do this manually for every property in every class that uses smart properties? Supposing that we did, are we going to have to keep it in sync for every change to any of these properties or any addition? Do we have to do all of this manually? That sounds very error prone and brittle, but maybe we can automate this. And indeed we can using a gem called Tapioca. So I joined Shopify about three years ago and started a reform team whose goal was to adopt gradual typing on Shopify's huge monolith. The leading tool for doing gradual typing on Ruby code bases at the time was Sorbet, and we started to work with the Sorbet team to understand how we can effectively use it. By mid-year of 2019, we were able to run Sorbet on our code base successfully and made it a mandatory check on our CI.
However, this initial adoption had low coverage, about 48%, and many of our files were effectively not being type checked at all. This is both a blessing, the blessing and the curse of gradual typing, by the way. You can get started relatively easily, but your type's coverage will not grow unless you keep pushing it further. And we wanted to keep pushing it further. So our team regrouped and we discussed how we should tackle the rest of our code base. In order to understand that, we needed to understand what was blocking our adoption in the first place. We quickly realized that the biggest blocker was the lack of static artifacts, like the one I showed you, from many of the DSL usages in our code base. This was especially true since our monolith is a giant Rails code base. However, Rails DSLs were not our only problem. We had a, lots of smaller DSLs coming from different gems and some DSLs that were developed inside the repository. So we needed a way to make it easy to generate RBI files for all of these DSL patterns in an automatic and an extensible way. By that point, we had already built the tapioca gem to generate RBI files describing the types exported from gems. Since Tapioca already knew how to generate RBI files, we decided that we can also teach it to understand these DSL patterns so that we can automate the creation of these DSL RBI files. The way we built this was in the form of a generator pipeline. Each DSL pattern is handled by a single DSL RBI generator class that knows how to decode the DSL implementation and surface the missing methods and constants in an RBI file. Each DSL generator has to subclass from the Tapioca compiler's DSL base class and implement two abstract methods, decorate and gather constants. The generator pipeline is a two-step process. All DSL generators in an application are discovered first and their gather constants method is called. Each generator is responsible for discovering the constants that use their particular DSL pattern. For example, for smart properties, it would have to find all classes that include the smart properties module. In the second step, all of these constants that are gathered are processed one by one and passed to the decorate method of each DSL generator if it can consume it. The DSL generator is passed an RBI tree and the constant itself. At that point, it is the DSL generator's job to add the necessary nodes to the RBI tree based on the given constant. That's why the name of this method is decorate, since a given constant could be using multiple DSL patterns, so the corresponding RBI file would be decorated by multiple DSL generators. Let's see this in action by looking at what a simple generator for smart properties might look like. As I mentioned before, the gather constants method finds all classes that have included the smart properties module. It does this by an inefficient method by going through the object space, but this is only called once at boot time. So we don't really care about efficiency at this point. Then the decorate method uses the properties method defined by smart properties on the constant to find which methods were defined. It adds a class definition node to the RBI tree first, and then adds a getter and a setter method definition for each property to that class definition node. And that's it. That's all the code you need to write to automatically generate RBI files for the missing smart properties methods. Notice how the RBI generator for the smart properties looks a lot like how smart properties might itself be implemented. Instead of defining a method at runtime on the class, we define a method on the RBI tree that corresponds to that class. If we run this generator on the message example class that I gave before, we will get an RBI file that looks something like this. Note that we have the getters and the setters for all the properties defined on the message class here. And we also have signatures that declare the types, but all the types are TM typed because we never put them in there. This framework and many generators are already built into Tapioca, and we already have DSL generators implemented for many of the common DSL patterns we have in use at Shopify today. 
Notice that our priority has been to cover most of the Rails DSL patterns since we are a big Ruby on Rails shop at Shopify. A simple bin slash tapioca DSL command on a Rails application at Shopify should generate RBI files for all the Rails DSL usages in that application. As I've mentioned, we're currently heavily invested in Sorbet, and thus we exclusively generate RBI files at Shopify. However, that doesn't mean that there are no solutions if you want to use RBS instead. Poke from the Ruby core team, who also has a talk tomorrow, has a repo called RBS Rails, which does a similar thing for generating the missing methods from various Rails DSLs uh, as RBS files. I urge you to take a look at it and contribute to it if you work with RBS. So why should anyone care about all of this? As I mentioned earlier in this talk, our motivation was to expose runtime defined methods so that they could be statically analyzable. However, we quickly found that the same artifacts that allow type checkers to analyze the code base better led to better developer tooling as well. The RBI files that we've generated have enabled developers to find the methods that normally have no traces in the code base. Thus, similarly to what Mamesan said at the opening keynote today, through the work we did to allow static analysis, we enabled better understanding and readability of the code base as well. Static analysis is not an end, it is a means for improving your developer productivity. I want to give you a taste of what is possible by going back to my original Rails app problem from nine, nine years ago. Remember that I had generated a user model, but the model was empty. Let's see if we can make that experience better. After adding tapioca to the project jam file and initializing it, let's run the tapioca command to generate the DSL RBI file for the user model. We can see that the command eager loads the Rails application, loads all the DSL generator classes, and compiles the DSL RBI file for user into the sorbet slash RBI slash DSL user dot RBI file. If we look at this generated file, we can see that the setters and getters for name and role are there, as well as created at and other default attributes like ID. Not only do we have all the methods defined on the user class, but we also get their type information as well. Soon, we will also be adding code comments on top of these method definitions so that developers can see why a method was generated and which DSL it was generated from. This will allow these generated methods to be even more helpful to developers. You can see this in action in an editor here. This is an example user decorator class that takes a user instance and redefines name and role getters. See that if we hover over the name getter for the user instance, we get full documentation about it. The documentation is saying that this name getter was added by active record because the users table had a name column. And same thing for the role getter. Also, if we right click the role um, method and say, go to definition, um, it actually takes us to the RBI file where it's defined with its signature and with the same code comment. Like I said, we don't generate the code comments today, but I wanted to include it as an example of what's possible tomorrow. And that's actually very neat. So thank you for listening to me. Um, we have a Shopify after hours AMA tomorrow at 3 p.m. GAST, you're invited to attend and ask any further questions about my talk and all other talks by Shopify engineers. Um, here's the link to uh, register for the AMA. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you enjoy the rest of Ruby Kaigi. I'm really enjoying it. I will be answering any questions in the chat if you have them, um, and I'll see you around.